You are listening to The Overwhelmed Brain. Today's episode is brought to you by GetOutOfTheMess.com. Quality attorneys at established law firms for about, I don't know, 20 bucks a month. 20 a month to talk to an attorney? Are you annoyed by affirmations? Are you tired of that same old rehashed personal growth advice that all seems to boil down to think positively and all your problems will go away? If affirmations feel like lies and positive thinking feels like denial, then I want you to get ready. The Overwhelmed Brain is here to help you create the life you want now. Welcome to The Overwhelmed Brain. My name is Paul Coliani. I am your personal empowerment coach. If we don't work together on a more intimate level, one-on-one coaching, then I want to give you this one-on-one for today, for this episode. And for those who don't know who I am, I am a personal empowerment coach. I'm here to help you increase your emotional intelligence, strengthen your self-worth and self-esteem, and empower you so that you can make decisions that are right for you. And just know that everything I talk about on this show is my personal opinion and is meant for informational and educational purposes only. Always consult your physician or therapist or psychiatrist or psychotherapist or counselor. What else is there? There's the licensed massage. No, the (laughs) whoever you need to consult with before making any changes to your psychological or medical treatments. Uh, Now that I got that out of the way, I'm going to go straight into an email that I received that um, talks a little bit about uh, escapism and fantasy and some of the things that I think we all do from time to time, which is indulge in daydreaming and thinking about um, doing other things to just, I don't know, we pass the time uh, indulging in some sort of fantasy or imagination. And I'm just going to read this email and you'll you'll see what I mean. This is uh, from someone I'm going to call Bill. Bill says, first off, I want to say thank you so much for this podcast and everything you do. You're welcome, Bill. I've been listening to it for a little while now, and it's been a huge help. I feel like I'm finally getting some quality tools to help with things that I've been dealing with. Really good to hear. I do have an issue that I want to ask you about. I use fantasy as a crutch often, and lately I've found out that it just hurts me more than it helps me. For about 20 years now, I've been abusing escapism to fill needs that I'm not getting. I used to play video games for hours at a time or binge watch entire TV shows just to not feel whatever I was feeling at the time. I've since weaned myself off of those for the most part, but daydreaming is still a big part of my life. I often find myself imagining what life would be like with certain people or considering certain aspects of being in a healthy relationship. Things like uh, dates, major life events, dream vacations with someone. I think it's pretty clear that I do this just to fill the needs that I'm not getting, and admittedly, When I'm in relationships, this tends to stop. I've always used this crutch to get through being alone, but I want to stop this. Thanks to you, I'm really committing myself to finding out how to fill my own emotional needs. I don't want to have to need outside sources to feel good. I'm not sure how to stop this kind of thing, as it's been one of my main tools in dealing with my own issues. I can manage to curb it during the day by keeping myself busy with hobbies or work or friends, but especially at night, I find myself back in my own little world. I'm sure that when I'm able to feel complete and whole on my own, that this will stop. But during my journey to that point, I find it very hard to ignore the attractiveness of immediately feeling a need through artificial means. What are some ways to fight against that? I tried to make this as short as I could. If you do read this, thank you so much. And if not, I think that putting this out there has helped me in some way as well. Thanks, Bill. Okay, Bill, thank you so much for sharing that. That is a really excellent question, actually. It's uh, something I've never been asked because, um, well, I just guess that many people probably don't think it's a problem. You know, I've, I know the statistics that people come home and like watch TV for hours and hours after work. A lot of people play video games. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. It's very engaging. It's very psychologically engaging for the brain. I know this because I used to play video games for hours and hours when I was younger. I remember getting the old Atari when I was a kid, and uh, that got me hooked on it. And then 
then uh, what was next? The Nintendo systems, and then I got a Turbo Graphics system, and then I got a PlayStation. So I kept playing those games uh, in my 20s and even my 30s. And every now and then, I'll have to admit, I play a game nowadays. I mean, we all had those games on our phones, right? <laughs> it is something to pass the time when you're waiting in line, when you're just bored, or I don't know. But there are times, I mean, I don't have the same amount of time I used to have, uh, but certainly when you're alone, passing the time doing that, in my personal opinion, isn't so much a problem. Now, when it becomes a problem is when it is replacing something that you may need to address in yourself. Now, you said uh, in your letter, you know, I didn't actually hear or read anything that you said that had to do with your emotional space. I mean, yes, I think you said certain things about your emotional space, but not necessarily saying that you were in a bad emotional space. You didn't really say that you were avoiding these negative uh, issues that you're carrying with you or some emotional wounding or baggage that you're holding on to. You worded this in a way where you are filling needs that you have with an artificial supply. And so how I interpret that is, for example, after my divorce, I didn't have someone to share a bed with. I didn't have someone to share a space in a, a home with. I didn't have someone to go to the movies with. I didn't have someone to share life experiences with, share my secrets with, all this stuff. And once she was gone, then I felt really alone. And I think we've all felt that feeling before. And there are ways to be alone that are probably more healthy than others. But there's also the stages of grieving something like a breakup or a divorce that I think also need to be gone through so that you can get through some healing, like the grieving of the death of the relationship. I'm not saying that's what you're going through or what you're experiencing. I don't exactly know what level you're at in life. You did say you're single. Uh, but after my divorce, when I was single, I remember lying in bed with my little tablet, my little tablet computer, and watching uh, improv. I was watching like Whose Line Is It Anyway? It's a comedy show. And I would watch that and start to laugh. And it felt good to laugh. <laughs> and I was thinking, there's nothing wrong with wanting to laugh. And later on, I thought, you know, I used that little tablet computer every night while lying in bed. I was alone, there's no one around, or my laptop. I would pull my laptop out too, but a little tablet's easier. And so I would lay there, watch what I was watching on the tablet, and then I might play a game. And uh, I think the game that always put me to sleep was Scrabble. <laughs> and so as, when I started spelling uh, on the computer, the little computer screen, I would fall asleep. So that was helpful to fall asleep. Otherwise, if I wasn't watching anything, I would lay there and wait and wait, <laughs> and wait, and not fall asleep. And, you know, I was going through some hard times, too, because I'm divorced, and look what I've been relegated to. I'm living in a room in my mom's house, and there's nothing I can do because I'm in this miserable space, and I don't really feel like I can, like, be out on my own. And sometimes people don't have that option. Sometimes there's a breakup or a divorce, and they are out on their own, and they can't really do anything about it. They just have to pushed through it. And one of my coping mechanisms while I was alone and newly divorced uh, was artificially connecting with people on a video screen. And that is one thing that the artificial uh, means that you're talking about help is that you feel like you're part of something bigger. You feel like you are part of someone else's life, someone else's family. And like I said, I don't necessarily agree that that's a bad way to go. I don't think you should watch all day, every day. But I think at the moments uh, that you're really down, uh, you know, besides working on your own personal growth and healing, which I'll get to in a moment, that it's okay to indulge in something that takes your mind 
off of the continuous concern or worry or anxiety or something or another. I mean, we live in a technological age. We have all this technology available and there are psychologically beneficial things about this technology. There are also psychologically damaging things about this technology where a lot of people stare at their phones a lot of the times. A lot of people stare at their phones when they're with others. A lot of people answer their phones when they're in deep conversation with someone they love. Whereas in the past, before cell phones and things like that, you had to go home and wait for the call. <laughs> you had to go home and make new phone calls to other people. You couldn't text. So I could go on and on and on about that. But the idea that there are benefits to technology and there are detriments to technology is just the way it is. So let me get to your question before I go off on that uh, totally non sequitous path <laughs> because this isn't about look what technology has done to this world. I for one have embraced technological advances. I think they're fascinating. I love it. I got into IT at a young age. I was 13. I got my first computer and now I'm 47 and I've owned computers and gotten into technology all my life and uh, most of the time it makes life easier and is beneficial for the things that you do in life if utilized properly and moderately and not stuck in some world of Warcraft for 72 hours straight. <laughs> That's just a game out there that some people really get sucked into and they can't stop playing because of the psychological aspect. So let me talk about that. Let's talk about the psychological aspect of what technology does and how it can be beneficial and how it can be detrimental. First of all, I do believe that self-healing is vital above all. I, I do believe that should be the big vision for ourselves when uh, we have anything that we're still holding on to. You know, I'm still mad at my uncle. I'm still mad at my father. I am still um, feel unloved or abandoned or rejected by my mother. There's all kinds of things that we hold on to that if we use technology as that, uh, replacement for dealing with those things, then those negative, repressed, emotional wounds continue to stay with us throughout our life, and then they come out in uh, bad ways. We end up losing relationships, we lose jobs, we lose friendships, we lose all kinds of things that we may not have lost, or we may have taken a different path had we not held on to something negative all our life. And I understand there's a lot to healing. There's a lot of processing that uh, some of us have to do. And sometimes we can't find the right help or are afraid to tell anyone what happened to us in our past. But that's what this show is about, expressing and finding someone safe and honoring yourself and doing behavior today that helps alleviate the uh, pain or upset or wounds that you're holding on to from the past. That's what this show, you know, really helps with. But um, when you never address that stuff and you always find a coping mechanism, for example, TV, video games, uh, movies, um, podcasts, <laughs> when you find uh, coping mechanisms that don't address what's going on inside of you, like uh, watching the Transformers movie might not address the emotional pain in you, but it could, I don't know, but uh, it might make you feel better. So it's, it's sort of like a quick high. And I think that's what technology does. It gives us that quick high. And that high, you know, the endorphins run through our system, the chemical changes that happen. We laugh. Like I laugh in bed every night when I was divorced because I was watching comedy. And that did help. But, you know, after that was done, after I woke up the next day, I still had stuff to deal with. I still had healing to go through. So... Where am I taking you, Bill? Where am I taking this? Where I'm taking this is, surprisingly, I don't necessarily want you to stop indulging in fantasy and escapism. Because every tool and resource in your belt has a function, a purpose, and you know a rhyme and a reason and a season. Every single thing in your life. Even when I talk about like the people pleasers in life and the rescuers and the codependents. All of these things sound dysfunctional, but they all have a purpose 
if used in the right context, to create a, a benefit for you and others involved. I'm not saying that those behaviors in general are healthy, but almost every behavior has a function that if used in the right context at the right time could actually be beneficial. Now, that's a huge topic. I'll have to address it in bits and pieces as the show goes on for years and years. But in this case, with the technology helping you through uh, loneliness, helping you through bad feelings, great. I say it's okay, even though that might be the opposite advice. <laughs> you might hear elsewhere, I don't know. But I say it's okay, uh, but only in moderation. Now, that's very common advice, of course. And also, and this is where I'm taking you, also, I want you to balance it out with enough time for yourself with self-connection. Self-connection is, well, there's many ways to do that. I like to be in nature. I like to go outside, get out of a sterile environment, get out of a familiar environment. I even like to travel to another environment. I might go to a coffee shop and have tea or eat lunch while I'm there with my laptop. It's like I take myself with me and my technology with me, but I'm, I'm, I'm in a different environment. So in a way, I am indulging in escaping where I sit every day to go sit somewhere else. That's just one tiny little example of what I mean. But how do you connect with yourself? You do things that almost force you to be with yourself and face yourself without the engagement of something else. So if that means you go somewhere alone and be with yourself so that whatever's inside comes up, for example, I'm going to go bowling by myself. Then you go bowling and then you go, well, damn, this is kind of lonely. <laughs> I'm sitting here bowling by myself. This isn't as fun as I thought it was going to be. And then you can explore, well, what would I like better? Would I like to be with so-and-so? How do I feel? I feel lonely. How does being lonely make me feel? And then you think, well, uh, being lonely makes me feel sad. Okay, let's connect with that sadness. Let's just let it come up. Yeah, but I'm bowling. Okay, well, finish your string. <laughs> and then when you're done, go connect with that sadness. That's a way to connect with yourself. I'm not saying it's going to be fun to connect with these uh, negative emotions that come up, but you connect with that sadness or whatever comes up, and then you think, well, what else is in there? And so what you do is explore. But then you don't stay there. It's not like I'm telling you to now stay in that sadness until it's resolved. I'm saying that you're allowing everything inside you to have a voice, to have a moment of expression, to have a moment to exist. I'm allowing my feeling of rejection to exist. I'm acknowledging it. I'm validating it. You know what that does? That validates the inner child. That validates how you felt when you were first invalidated, when you were first, whatever, rejected, when you first felt sad, when you were first abandoned. You know, all of these things that you might have had to face when you were younger, they, they come up at certain times. So when they come up, you explore, you express, you acknowledge, and you validate, and you be okay having those emotions and those feelings and those thoughts and those memories. Just let them come up. I'm not saying that you have to process them right away. It's just a matter of step, taking that first step and acknowledging what's going on inside of you. But not going so far on the other end of the pendulum swing. And this is somewhere else I'm taking you. This is, a, this is the addendum to the last point. <laughs> is that when you quit something, like you were relying on fantasy, you were relying on artificial means to indulge yourself, to uh, engage your brain and uh, keep it busy so you didn't have to visit wherever you normally go, then what you do is you balance your life with a little bit of this and a little bit of that. You know, a little bit of video games, a little bit of TV, a little bit of me time, a little bit of nature. You start balancing it out. Like when I was in my 20s, I got this game once. Um, 
and it was like a strategy game or something. And uh, I started playing. It was the first time I ever played it. And I think three or four hours went by. And when I was done playing the game, I looked at the clock and I said, what the hell just happened? I cannot believe that much time went by. I suddenly felt like I wasted three hours of my life doing something that made no difference in the real world. It just felt like a huge waste of time. And I immediately uninstalled the game. <laughs> I didn't want to I didn't want to deal with it anymore. I was like, that's it. I can't play this anymore. It was a lot of self-discipline because it was actually an enjoyable game. But it was just like, oh, I think about the waste of time. But I did have other games that I could play for 15 minutes. And then I got some satisfaction. I got some sense of um, thrill out of doing that. And that allowed me to go on to the next thing I needed to do. And I've noticed that um, as games got more complex and story-driven and longer and longer in gameplay, I started to enjoy them less because it was taking up more and more of my time. And at one point I decided, you know what, I'm going to continue playing the older games. I like actually being able to play a game for only five or ten minutes because it doesn't continue to suck me into something that's so drawn out that my life goes by. So what I'm saying here is that you take these artificial means of engagement and you do it in moderation. Uh, so you develop a what I like to call maybe a reward system. Like if I spend a half hour of me time, I've earned a half hour game. If I've spent an hour of me time, I've earned an hour of TV. This is where self-discipline starts. Self-discipline starts to provide a structure in life. And structure starts to help you gain some sense of routine in life. And routine helps you know what's coming and gives you a sense of maybe even purpose. I know that's a stretch. I'm really reaching out there. But as you start to schedule or structure your life like that, where you develop a reward system, then you don't become so indulgent and do things way beyond the time that maybe you think you shouldn't. So I think what's important is to start treating fantasy and your indulgence and escapism, like you said, and uh, anything that takes you away from the real world, whatever that is, <laughs> and make that the reward. Make that the reward for connecting with yourself, for allowing those emotions to come up inside of you. Because as you do that more and more, you're acknowledging a part of yourself that needs acknowledgement, that needs validation. Like you said, you think you're filling up these needs by indulging in other things. Like, um, I don't feel love, so I'm going to watch a love story. Or I feel really angry, so I'm going to watch a violent movie. Or whatever. You get these needs fulfilled surrogately through other means. And what that does is create sort of um, an artificial feeling of purpose. Like I watched the entire season of this show and now I feel like I'm a part of it and I feel like I know every character and their quirks and it's fun to watch and I feel like that gives me a sense of purpose when I go home every night and I want to watch that or something like that. And that sense of purpose can't last because it's not really something that you're in. Unless you join the, the fan club of the show and <laughs> you're talking to all the fans and now you have something all in common, which can also be good. But now you're making that people connection instead of that uh, technology connection. So let me wrap this up and just say that uh, I personally don't believe technology, fantasy, uh, TV, video games or any of that stuff is necessarily bad. In my opinion, it should be done in moderation and only used as a reward. It's sort of like, you know what, I worked all day and I'm going to come home and I, I have earned my two hours of TV, maybe four hours of TV, maybe six hours of TV. I don't know. But if it takes up your entire time off, then that is something that I would consider probably too much. Unless you're happy, unless you're OK, unless you're not holding on to any emotional wounds or pain from the past, because I'm all about if it works, don't stop. If it makes you happy you know, and it's healthy and it's not harming anyone else, 
then it's probably a good path for you. And, you know, as long as you're not um, so isolated and agoraphobic and you never want to leave your house, then maybe you want to look at something else there. Maybe you might want to consider talking to people, talking to a therapist or what have you. But uh, if it's just been an indulgence, then you limit the indulgence, not by necessarily stopping cold turkey, but by moderating it in a way where it becomes more rewarding to do. Now, my final words will be that as you do this, your desire for indulgence, for a fantasy world like a video game or a TV show might start to wane because you're giving yourself enough of that me time, enough of that connection that you realize there is meaning and purpose there. Now, this doesn't discount the idea of going out and visiting with friends and connecting with people. Like I said, you could join a a fan club for a TV show and you can all get together and talk about the TV show because something like that might spread out into other things. You're actually connecting with people and now you are a part of something bigger than yourself. You are a part of some other family. So that might be a path that ends up opening up for you. I mean, in that example, it could be a path for someone doing that. It could be a path for anyone that is a big fan of something that might be part of a fantasy. There are fantasy groups that get together. There's role-playing game groups that get together. There's all kinds of groups that get together that have the same interests, and they're quite happy. They love talking about what they talk about. So overall, I'm not against any of what you just mentioned, but I have witnessed in my own life that as you start connecting with yourself more and more and making it very interesting and fascinating, like, like I do. I think that the human brain is fascinating. I think our behavior is fascinating. And I love learning more about it. There's always more to learn. And uh, learning how we relate and how we communicate. So that has been my path. And when I go out and connect with myself, I like to watch others and see their behavior and see what happens. And of course, I meet with friends and we all talk and it's great. We get along and it fulfills me to be able to talk to other people. So when you ask about how do you fight against this uh, desire to do all this stuff, I say just include it in bits and pieces. Don't necessarily be against it. And as the days and weeks and months go by and you have this moderation and this balance of this and that, you'll have so much more exposure than just the artificial means that you'll probably be driven by a different purpose and a different meaning in your life. And when you have that, the door to another path could be what opens and uh, sets you in another direction. So I hope that helps. I hope that makes sense to you and uh, gives you something that you need. Thank you so much, Bill. Thanks for writing. Send me an update sometime. Be right back. I want you to call Asha at getoutofthemess.com. How's that for a command? <laughs> no, Asha's been on the show a few times, and uh, she is, uh, like I said, with getoutofthemess.com, and uh, she is an independent associate for Legal Shield. I know you've heard of Legal Shield. They used to have thousands of commercials. I, I just remember hearing them all the time. But um, she can connect you with this service, and uh, the reason she does what she does is because She wants to make sure that you, first of all, need the service and if it's going to work for you. You know, Legal Shield is that uh, monthly service that allows you to call an attorney, uh, get letters written by attorneys, ask them questions. Uh, You can get your will done. You can have like speeding tickets taken care of. Well, I shouldn't say taken care of, but they look at it and I think they can, well, they do sometimes take care of it. Uh, But there are things that uh, they do that uh, can only be done by an attorney. And um, one of the most important things they do is guidance. You know, I love when someone in the know can guide me to what I need to do next. And um, she gets a lot of calls for people that are in situations, they're in messes, and uh, or they get in messes a lot, and they're like, well, this service, do this for me, and this is the mess I'm in, and I have I have no idea what to do next, or I'm afraid that he or she is going to take me to court or I'm afraid that uh, it's going to end up bad. What do I do? And uh, she'll say, okay, 
you know, I'm not an attorney, <laughs> but I can connect you with one. But let me tell you what the service does for you. And she answers those questions. And that's her specialty. She's been doing this for like seven or eight years now, answering people's questions about Legal Shield and uh, letting them know if it's going to work for them or not. She is the absolute best intermediary for you to understand exactly what this is all about. Because, you know, you look online and you see all this stuff about it and you're not sure if it's going to work and you have specific questions and, you know, who do you ask? Well, that's her. Like I said, she's an independent associate and uh, that means when you call her, she'll have the answers you need to see if it's going to work or not. She loves the service, but she also knows that if it doesn't work for you, she doesn't want you to get it. (laughs) So I want you to call her and find out if this service is right for you. Her number is 678-355-8777. And that's in the U.S. or Canada. If you're in the U.S. or Canada, that's uh, the number you call. And you can also go to her website at getoutofthemess.com. All right, Marie wrote me a letter about something that is uh, very tough um, in the sense of what do I do about my kids and their narcissistic dad? And I don't think she's together with him anymore. She said that I was wondering if you could do a show on kids and how to deal with a narcissistic father or mother. My son has issues with his father. He knows he's not well, but the dad always discusses things with him Uh, that a child his age shouldn't have to deal with. I know my son loves his father, but he knows that what his dad gives him and shows him is close enough to love, and I know this hurts him because when it was me, it happened to me and it tore me apart back then. Okay, so it sounds like you were married or something back then, and uh, you are no longer with this person. Thank you, Paul, and uh, use Marie for my name. I did. Thank you, Marie. And uh, yes, what a situation. I mean, if your ex is fully narcissistic or you know has narcissistic tendencies that's going to be a tough situation because they really want what they want and they'll do anything to get what they want and they don't really think about the effect that it has on others so with your child that's the toughest part i don't even know if there is a set of steps that you can take with children because narcissists do things in a subtle way that in my experience have been very difficult to pinpoint. I mean, that's why I came up with the mean workbook to help you pinpoint the behaviors that you see. And once you have those behaviors pinpointed, then you know what you're dealing with, with, um, narcissism and emotional abuse or manipulation. All of these things work in a, in a way to get past the psychological filters that we usually have up. Like I watched uh, Dwayne with Dad Surviving Divorce, very popular YouTube channel. He's also one of my interviews in the Mean Workbook. Uh, if you don't know what that is, just go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash mean, M-E-A-N. And if you pick up that workbook, you'll hear my interview with him and how he talks about his marriage to a very covert narcissist and how challenging it was and what he did and what you can do to um, start healing and uh, getting to a place of empowerment. But he talked about how uh, narcissists can be very uh, passive aggressive and not necessarily say mean things like his uh, the video I watched was him saying that the narcissistic parent might say something like, you know, did you know that daddy tried to get your uncle fired from work? And that doesn't sound like they're saying anything mean like against the other parent, but you can tell the seed that's being planted with that statement like did you know that mommy did this to so-and-so and And that plants a seed in the child's mind? Like, wow, I wonder why mommy would do that because that made so-and-so feel pretty bad. And then they start, the child starts connecting the dots and thinking, wow, mommy must be a mean person or, you know, something like that. Narcissists, manipulators, they know how to do that. They know how to turn people against you and make your life very difficult. So uh, Marie, you were married to a narcissist and you had to get out of that relationship and I'm glad that you are no longer in that situation because that's a very difficult situation to be in. Um, But you didn't tell me anything about his behavior necessarily. 
you just said that his dad discusses things with him uh, that a child his age shouldn't have to hear. So I'm going to assume that that behavior is what you're most focused on, but I'm also going to say that it's almost impossible to stop it. And anything that you do to resist it or fight against it might actually work against you because you might be there trying to convince your child that uh, what he's saying is wrong or bad, but then the child goes back and says, you know, mommy says that you're wrong or bad for saying that, and now you start the narcissistic manipulation against you again, and, you know, it's, it's a very toxic situation, and it seems impossible to get out. So uh, before I really answer this in the direction I want to go with it, let me just say this. I am not a child psychologist. I do not work with children specifically. And what I'm about to say is my own opinion. I know I put the disclaimer at the front of the show, but I want to tell you now that this is all my own opinion and you should get professional advice for this because this is just something that uh, I've considered and have my own insights on, but they aren't necessarily a truth that you should carry with you just consider them the thoughts of a friend. (laughs) These are my thoughts. I want your children to grow up happy and healthy and don't want to give you advice that works against that. So with that said, I think you understand what I'm saying, but with that said, I want to say this. The first thing, and I kind of already said this, is don't defend or convince or try to prove anything to your kid. Just ask questions. So if the narcissist says something bad about you or calls you a mean person or whatever, uh, don't try to convince your kid that you're not that. And don't try to prove anything like, well, this is what your daddy really did. And this is what is really going on. Just ask your child questions. So this will help the child come up with their own answers because they're brilliant. They're more brilliant than most people realize, and they will come up with their own answers if you lead them with good questions. So questions like, um, how does that make you feel? You know, that's a great question, right? Uh, You know, daddy said this. And instead of you going, he said what? (laughs) You say, well, how did that make you feel? And then what that does is allow the child I mean, this is probably a very good thing. Allow the child to access those emotions inside of him or her and let them know it's okay to have feelings about something. How did that make you feel? The child may go, I don't know. <laughs> but it allows the child to have them if they have them. Uh, what? And you can ask, like, what did you think when daddy said that? Well, I thought this and this. Oh, really? What else did you think? How else did you feel? Do you feel sad about that? What else did he say? And you ask questions. You be inquisitive. And you never make it scary for the child to answer. You never go, what? What did he say? (laughs) You never want to do that. Again, this is my opinion. Because you don't want to show your anger towards someone else to the child. Because the child doesn't know what's going on. They're just in the middle of all this. And they're trying to figure out. But if you make it so safe and comfortable for them to talk to you, which means turning off any anger you might have, any negative emotions about this this whole situation or your ex or whatever, and you go, well, you know, what else happened? How did you feel about that? Oh, really? And you're just inquisitive. You know, you sound curious. You sound like they're taking you through a story. And then you take mental notes, but you never show the anger. You never show the negativity to them. You do have to hold that in until it's appropriate with someone else because the child is the innocent here and they're the ones probably being manipulated. So you want to ask those questions and asking those questions helps them explore and helps you understand where they are. So if your child says something like, well, that means you're a bad person, mommy, you would ask another question. That might be hard to hear, but you got to remember this child isn't in full belief systems yet. Their beliefs and perceptions and values are still being formed, which is why questioning is great. So you hear something like, that means you're a bad person. You could ask the next question, which might be, do you think I'm a bad person? 
and that will self-empower them, self-initiate them to come up with the answer on their own because you're asking them specifically, do you think I'm a bad person? Or do you really think I'm a bad person? And if they say another hurtful thing like, yes, then again, don't become defensive because this is a child just learning how to work in the world. What, what works and what doesn't in the world? And how do I feel about certain things? You allow him to feel that. And then you ask another question. You, you can even redirect and go, okay, did you think I was a bad person when, I, when we went to the water park that day? And you can remind him of a good event. And the child will hopefully say no. But it's always asking questions. It's always being curious and not giving them any fear for answering. Like, you better answer right. I mean, that's what they might feel, even though you're not trying to convey that message because you're mad at someone else, your ex. So anyway, that's the first thing I'm thinking is that you don't defend, convince, or try to prove anything. Just ask questions. And continue asking the feeling questions. Those are really good to ask. How does that make you feel? How do you feel about that? How did that make you feel when he said that? How does that make you feel when he does that? All those things. It allows them to express their emotions and uh, give them a safe place to do that. And if you have an emotionally abusive ex that tries to turn your children against them, another one, another question to consider and reword as you see fit might be, uh, why do you think he or she thinks I'm a bad person? You know, you allow the child to explore the reasons and whatever reasons they come up with, that'll help you know where they are in their head. Why do you think he thinks I'm a bad person? Well, he thinks you're bad because, you know, you said such and such, or you did this to Uncle Joe or whatever. Oh, so he thinks I'm a bad person because of that. You could say something like that. It helps also redirect that your ex thinks you're the bad person, not the child. Even if the child said, well, I think you're a bad person because he said you're a bad person, you can say, oh, why does he think I'm a bad person? You're always putting it back on who is disseminating the information. The ex is disseminating the information. I mean, you, you can still ask the child, why do you think I'm a bad person? Uh, if it gets there, I mean, it's just all a matter of where the child takes you in their thought processes as they explore. So the next thing, and I think the final thing is to... Um, and this is probably very effective, is to use uh, metaphors and analogies. When there's something to compare that your child can relate to, like if you use a story, then that child can also take that story and relate it back to real life. For example, you ask the child, do you know how to drive a car? And they say no, if they don't know how. And then you go, well, do you know how to fly a plane? And they go, no. And then you say, well, do you know how to mm, fill out a tax form? And then they say, what are those? <laughs> and then you go, right, you don't even know what tax forms are, do you? And they go, no. Then you can ask a question like, uh, do you think everyone knows everything they need to know? Do you know everything? Like uh, how many stars are in the sky? And you start making it fun. And they go, no. And then you start with the analogy or the metaphor. You can say, that's how parents are too. We don't know everything and we need to learn. Mommy doesn't know how to fix the refrigerator if it stops working. And daddy doesn't know how to fix the TV if it won't turn on. And sometimes daddy doesn't know how to say things right, so it makes you feel bad. Do you ever feel bad around me or daddy? You know, and see how the child answers. And you're relating the story of not everyone knows everything and what you're doing is leading them onto a path of understanding that there might be a different way to look at it. Like if his father is treating him badly then the child doesn't understand it, like in your letter, Marie, then what kind of metaphor or story can you come up with that might help the child relate or understand why someone would treat them badly? And that's where I'm going with this is that you, know, you could say, do you ever feel bad around me or daddy? Both mommy and daddy need to learn how to love you more and more, but sometimes one of us doesn't do it right. We're both doing the best we can, but sometimes one of us fails miserably. Do you ever try to do something right and can't do it? Like trying to stack cards and then they fall over? Sometimes parents try really hard to say the right thing and it doesn't come out right. And then you might feel bad because we didn't know how to say it or 
We didn't know how to show you the love that you deserve. There's some uh, positive reinforcement in there as you're telling the story or bringing out the analogies. Because you want to remind them how worthy and lovable they are, even if another adult makes them feel bad. You're telling them about the mistakes that all adults can make and how some make more than others, but it doesn't diminish who the child is. It's positive reinforcement so that when there's any negative influence, it's always countered. You won't be able to thwart everything, but you will be the constant reminder of their worth. So that's my answer, Marie. Like I said, I'm not a child psychologist. That is a very challenging area, and it is something that I don't explore too much. But, you know, when I think about the best way to approach this, I want to always remind the child how worthy they are, how lovable they are, how important they are, so that if they are getting uh, the opposite feeling from another person, that they are reminded from you that all of that information is not valid, which is why it's helpful to help them explore their emotions and express and hopefully release anything they're holding on to. Because as they are exposed more and more to an unhealthy or dysfunctional parent, having a healthy or functional non-toxic parent to continually remind them of their worth will be sometimes the best thing and sometimes the only thing you can do because that can be a very tough situation to get out of, especially when both parents have shared custody and there's not enough visible damage that other people can see to make them not able to see their child by law or something. Uh, Usually that doesn't happen with uh, subtle manipulation or even covert manipulation. Sometimes the courts don't see enough to say, no, you can't be uh, near that child unsupervised. I mean, there are criteria in place that uh, you certainly need to meet and manipulation, uh, that's tough. That's a real tough one. So Marie, thank you so much for sharing this. That's the best I got. (laughs) There's probably more. If I come up with it, it'll be in another episode. But I wish you luck with this. Uh, this, It's difficult to have that kind of ex. And uh, anyone in a manipulative, emotionally abusive, or narcissistic relationship, I highly recommend the Mean Workbook so that you can pinpoint the behavior that you're witnessing, that you're feeling, that maybe you can't necessarily verbalize especially when you try to tell your friends and family and you're telling them this person is doing this to me and they're like what that's the nicest person i know i can't believe you'd say that about her or him and you just want to pull your hair out go to the overwhelmedbrain.com forward slash mean to check it out thanks for listening we'll be right back and i'll say some goodbyes and my final words after this Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to thank our sponsor, GetOutOfTheMess.com. I want you to call Asha at 678-355-8777 or go to GetOutOfTheMess.com and find out if what she calls this legal insurance is right for you. And I want to thank members of the patron program. If you're a patron, I appreciate you. And those who've donated to the show, I've sent you personal audio messages. I hope you got them. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you so much. And anyone who's purchased the Overwhelmed Brain book or the workbooks like the Mean Workbook or even use the Amazon link. You know, Christmas is coming and if you're shopping, go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com and click on the Amazon link. I'm not selling anything. I just use that link to help bring money to the show. So whatever you buy on Amazon, they send us a few pennies on the dollar for the stuff you buy and it really helps support the show. So Thank you if you're using that every time you shop. Your shopping habits are making a difference. And I mentioned the Mean Workbook in the last segment. I think that is a very important and educational uh, piece of material because what happens is that uh, you'll be in a very difficult relationship and you don't know why. It's like too complex. It's not supposed to be this complex. You're supposed to get into a relationship and you get happier and more fulfilled and you love seeing each other and being with each other. And then there are those relationships that you're happy at first and then 
when that quote honeymoon phase is over, it gets worse and worse and worse. It's not supposed to be like that at all. The honeymoon phase is supposed to lead into joy and comfort and peace and security and safety and other things. You know, we all have the ups and downs with those, but it's supposed to be the majority of the time, not a tiny, tiny minority. You're not supposed to have a complex and difficult relationship. That's not how life is supposed to be. That's why I created the Mean Workbook. Go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash mean if you think your relationship is just too difficult and it doesn't make sense and you can't figure it out. Check it out, theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash mean. And finally, thank you to Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in The Overwhelmed Brain. To close the show, I want to uh, speak from a very personal place. When I first met my girlfriend, she told me uh, that she had just uh, realized like a year previously that she was sexually abused as a child. And uh, the hardest part for her was sharing with me and a very few other people that um, she didn't remember. So she couldn't even really justify the, the event. She just knew it happened. And, you know, that's hard for someone who's never been sexually abused because that doesn't make any sense. How could you say something like that and not remember? So, you know, I explored this with her, not as a coach, but with someone who's getting to, getting to know her. And I was asking questions. I wanted to know more. And what did she remember? And boy, she said something like, um, you know, I don't remember the event, but everything that has happened in my life with these toxic relationships, with my promiscuity, with all the drugs. I mean, she's been through a lot when she was younger, but she couldn't figure out why she was such a rebel. She, she couldn't figure out why she did the things she did, why she couldn't stand certain people, why she couldn't uh, attract the right people, why she kept getting into emotionally abusive relationships and even sexually abusive relationships. And so when she hit her 40s, suddenly she had a flashback. Now, this is what happens with sexual abuse a lot of the times is that when a child is experiencing sexual abuse, they will sometimes dissociate. They will disconnect from their senses and their mind, their psyche, their spirit, whatever you want to call it, disconnects from being human for a little while, just goes into some sort of dormant or black hole state just to disconnect from the pain, the fear, everything else that's happening in that moment. This isn't always, but a lot of the times this happens to children is they dissociate and they are not really in their own body. It feels like an out-of-body experience, I assume. Whatever that feels like, if you're deep into meditation, you've probably had something like that. But uh, these children learn to do it at a very young age, so they're not suffering while it happens. Now, the good part of that is that they are able to do this. Again, not always. Not all children do this. There are many instances where Children grow up and they remember exactly what happened and it was awful, but some children do. And the children that do dissociate when they're going through any type of trauma or suffering like that don't tend to remember what happened. That plays a role in their life from that point on. The survivor of sexual abuse now has this thing that hovers over them or this feeling that they can't get rid of or this belief about people or certain people or they lash out doing bad behavior or unhealthy behavior. They meet toxic people and they keep them in their lives because they've equated suffering with love or they can't figure out the difference or they've learned to feel unworthy because they were so violated as a child or even when they were older. They learn to feel like they're not important. So they carry this around with them. And if you don't feel like you're important, you're going to have destructive behavior often. And it's going to create unhealthy, dysfunctional behavior in your life and attract unhealthy, dysfunctional people in your life until you get to the point where you realize, oh, wait, I know what's going on. I need to heal from this. doesn't always happen that way and it's not that easy. Uh, in fact, it might be one of the hardest things to get through and heal from, but it is possible. 
and my girlfriend took those steps and st- and is still taking those steps to healing. And along her journey, just before we met, like I said, a year before uh, we met, she had all these memories flood up and now she has little flashbacks here and there. She woke up one morning with the song, uh, Welcome Home Fiona. And she had the music in her head, the words, and even flashes of images that what she wanted to see in a music video. You know, she's a musician and she writes music. And so when she woke up with this, she went straight to her keyboard, wrote down all the music she could, wrote down all the words that she could, and she had this song develop in front of her eyes. And it was a very, very powerful and very healing song about child sexual abuse. And so, you know, like I said, I was getting to know her and she uh, played me this song and I, I started crying. It was just like, wow, not because it was a sad, uh, scary thing. You know, I know it is, but it was a very healing journey for this child to go through that she was writing about. And of course, that child is her. That child is anyone who's been sexually abused. And there is a path to healing for you if you've been sexually abused. And I believe this song is one of those many paths that you might want to take in your life because it's all about connecting, like I was talking about earlier, connecting with you, reconnecting with yourself, reconnecting with that inner child that needs you, that needs your comfort, that needs your love, that wants to know he or she is important, that wants to know he or she is loved and worthy. I want you to watch this video. I want you to vote for this video. It's actually up for an award. It's for uh, a positive music award. And uh, if she wins this award, it's not monetary, but if she wins it, the video will go out into the world and be a healing message for so many other survivors. So I'm not commanding you to do this. I'm begging you. (laughs) No, just go to the Fiona project.org forward slash vote and watch the video and follow the instructions for voting. You have to register your email address and then click the star rating. And that will allow the video to get out to the masses. This is such an important message. Like I said, I was in tears by the end of the video, by the end of the song, but not because it's sad. It's because it's healing. Yes, there's a couple sad parts in there. But if you want to heal, if you know someone that has gone through this and need to understand their plight, this is the video for you. And yes, there's a feel-good ending. Otherwise, I wouldn't be pushing it like I am. Go to thefionaproject.org forward slash vote, V-O-T-E. Cast your vote. Do some healing. Do some learning about friends and family who've been through sexual abuse. Believe me, you know someone. One out of four or five children have been sexually abused. So I think it's important to learn, to know, to heal and grow. Be there for others who have been through it. And if you've been through it yourself, I want you to take this healing step. TheFionaProject.org forward slash vote. And no matter what, whether you watch the video or not, always move toward healing. Some journeys are longer and they're more challenging than others, which is why it's always important to keep an open mind because I want you to step into your power and be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something I absolutely know to be true about you, you are amazing. (laughs) 